Hello, and welcome back to session two of Escape Velocity Extra. Hope some of you were tuned in to session one. We had a great panel of scientists talking about post-apocalyptic worlds. But here we are now to talk about a very specific post-apocalyptic world. It's a place called The Earth on a show called The Hundred. And in this session, we will be joined by three stars of the CW Network hit TV show. And uh, if you're watching this, you're probably already a huge fan of the show and can't wait to hear from the actors. So let's get right to it. Our first guest's character, Monty Green, is the character's name, lived a full heroic life through five seasons of The Hundred, and his character saved Sky Crew's bacon on numerous occasions with his brilliance and innovation. He most recently appeared in last year's Netflix miniseries, Tales of the City. Let's say hello to Christopher Larkin. Hi, everybody. Hey, I'm Chris. Here. Chris, good to see you. Me too. Our next guest is a legend in the world of science fiction, having appeared in Supernatural, Aliens vs. Predator, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Stargate SG-1, Battlestar Galactica, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes, among many others. He appeared in The 100 as Nyko, the compassionate grounder healer. Let's welcome Ty Olson. Hey, y'all. Uh, Hello all again, Ty. Good to see you. Good to see you. Last but not least, one of the top billed stars of the show since season one, in addition to his role as John Murphy in The 100, he has appeared in more than 60 movies and television series, including The Killing, Bates Motel, Caprica, Flash Gordon, Smallville, and Continuum. Let's bring on Richard Harmon. Hello again, Richard. Hello, everyone. Hey, guys, wasn't that kind of fun? Uh, you got to listen to those scientists a little bit. It's like... I it's watched the entire movie. thing. It was awesome. Yeah. But I'm about uh, to be here to tell them what, you know, post-apocalyptic worlds are really like. <laughs> That's right. They yeah. can dream, but you I guys think, live yeah, with it. They got, they got some ideas. I've got some facts. That's I'm right. By all of them were sitting behind rows and rows of books, and I've got fake flowers. I literally saw it. I saw the same thing you did. I saw. I was like, "How many books do these guys have?" I have a big screen TV. How shallow can you get? I just put this cool logo on it. But let's face it, it's my TV. Uh, so there you in go. Front of my, in front of my fridge. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's quite all right. Uh, look, guys, here we are in this pre-apocalyptic world, talking about a fictional post-apocalyptic world. You each seem to bring a specialty that might be useful in bad times. Richard, let's start with you. It's kind of an actor's dream to play a bad guy who then gets redeemed. Yeah. Um, if a real apocalypse hit, is there a lesson we can learn from John Murphy? Do you need to be a little cold and unfeeling to survive? Or does Murphy live as long as he did only because he started out being a good guy? Uh, uh, started being a good guy, not started out, started being a good guy for a while. I think if, I think if he was a good guy from the very beginning, um, of the show, I think he would be dead by now, undoubtedly. I think he would have died in the first season, for sure. Really? Uh, God, yeah. But I think I think him finding a little bit of his morality in there towards the middle and specifically coming in towards the end, that has helped him also stay alive. I think you need a little bit of a mix of both. You can't just be so one or the other. You need to be able to let your morals slide sometimes within the right realm of reason. So um, what's, what's the takeaway for you having lived this character so long? In real life, can you be a little bit, hey, I'm going to be a little bit of a bad guy for a while, get me what I want, or does it only work when you're acting? No, I luckily, I luckily live a, you know, a life that hopefully we all live where I don't ever have to be a bad guy to, you know, to live. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm able to just stay inside in my living room and be totally okay. <laughs> I read this funny quote. It was like, no matter how good of life you live, in somebody's story, in somebody's life, you are the bad guy. Oh, I've been told that a few times. Yeah, definitely. That reminds me of what they say in a writer's room. They say, in every writer's room, there's one asshole. And if you look around the room and you can't find the asshole, then it's you. Um, Morgan, who is the asshole in season four? Oh, good question. Uh -huh. In the writer's room? Yeah, we're yeah. Turning, turning around on you. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll call you later. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a case where I looked around and couldn't find out who it was. So I don't know if I want to go there. Yeah. Hey, Chris, as long as we're talking to you, Monty was a tech whiz. Uh, is that you in real life? You played it pretty convincingly. No. Uh, God, no. Yeah, thank you, Richard. God, no. Farthest thing from it. Go really? on. Go yeah. on. I'll be here to check you if you're Show us your phone. Show us your phone. 
That, that's my, oh my god. Is. That like wow. I'm a really bad Asian. My worst subjects were math and science from the start through college. So no, I'm a horrible techie in Dude, life. What? It's a flip phone. Flip, flip phone. That's collectible, man. I can't text them. I can only email the man. That's the only way that you'll get back to me. Is this just? By the way, Chris, I am emailing you back. It's just there's a lot to talk. Is, it, is it just a cool thing now? It's so cool to have a flip phone, or do you really not use a smartphone? No, I've never had one. They're coming back. Though. They're coming back flip phones. They're making like, I don't know. Yeah, they're bringing them I, back. Apparently, they're folding the screen. Now you're gonna be. Now you're gonna be. You know, trying to be hip all of a sudden. Yeah. So now you're gonna. Yeah. Have to, get a now, now yeah. you're gonna a smartphone. Chris, Chris, you're making music now. Doesn't that? Uh, doesn't that take some technical know-how or not? You just, what do you play? What instrument I mean, do you play? I play uh, just acoustic, um, but it's there all in garage band. Technical, it's like meant for dummies. Got it, got it. We'll have your your uh, your song on my computer. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. And we're, and we're bannering a, a link to your uh, some of your stuff, so I got to check that out. Yeah, there you That's go. Cool. Oh, cool. easy on hey. it. Hey, uh, Ty. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess being a healer for the grounders is kind of old school knowledge, but how does that work? Did you go to grounder med school? Is that what they set up there? You, you three I, years I, in the residency? How I, does that work? I've been to eight school before, but never a med school. <laughs> I think I had to really act for that one. Um, how, how, did it work? how did it work for Nico? How did he get to be a healer? Is that, does some old lady teach you how to do that? I, I really want to know. I, story that I created is that he was uh, he used to be a warrior and that if you take off his jacket and his shirt that he's got hundreds and hundreds of uh, kill stars and that he literally basically had an epiphany one day that he was tired of killing and um, having been a warrior for so long treating his own wounds and learning how to deal with with ailments and stuff like that he, once he decided that he wasn't going to take any more lives he uh, he dedicated himself to becoming a healer so in my in my imagination like if you take off his shirt he's just littered with kill scars like, and did we ever see that? I don't remember. Did he ever take his shirt off? Never, never so this is your own. Did, did the writers come up with this? Is this in your own head too? Completely in my own head. <laughs> I love it though. It's you know what that should have been an episode. Yeah, I think it would have been cool. I mean, uh, you know, the thing with Nico is he was such a great character. I think he was created to be a best friend to Lincoln. Um, mm. And then after that, I'm not sure what happened. Well, like whether they knew what to do with him. And I had great ideas in my head, but it's such a you know dynamic cast in such a giant world. You know, well, it is. And you all struggled with wanting to get your storyline in there once in a while, you know? And you know what you you all go through? I'm hearing this now. There's sort of a yin and yang thing to every character. Nico, you think, was a warrior, then a healer. Murphy, yeah. both good guy and bad guy. Monty took a turn to the dark side, right? Chris, was it season three that you were Pike's right-hand man, so to speak? Season two yeah. or season three? Yeah, it was three. I, I blew mom, but we took care of that. Yeah, that's that. right. But I would say... You went to the dark side a little bit. So maybe this is, is this just good drama to have diversity of attitude, even within a single character? Or did, did any of you have to nudge the writers and say, look, I don't want to be a one note, make me bad, make me good. Tell me how this comes out. Cause it seems to work great for an actor to be able to play both sides. Anybody? I'll take it. I, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think that it does make a character much more interesting to kind of be able to, you know, not just be a one note kind of person. Nobody wants to watch a character like that unless they're in it for just one scene for either comedy or some sort of effect. Those are the only types of things that could be one note is if you're really there for quite a short period of time. So no, I'm not personally did I ever need to nudge the writers in, in any sort of direction. I thought I was just going to be bad and that was going to be fun until I died. Right. And then it was them that were like, well, oh, keep you around. Maybe you can uh, get the audience on your side a little bit. And I was like, I'll try my best. I, I, I think you've gotten to a truism about humanity. Probably you look around at the world today, it's it can't be just black and white. It can't be all these people think one way and they're right. All these other people think the other way and they're wrong. We must all have a lot of good and bad. Is that a Michael Jackson song? Well, real human yeah. characters go through growth and changes, right? We're, we're all the sum of our experience, you know? Yeah. Sometimes it yeah. turns people into bad people and bad people into good people, depending on how, you, how you're how you affected by it and how, uh, how you just choose to grow from it. And that's true with the characters we play. Yeah, it's very cool to see just the fact that we have three actors and they've all gone, not through the same thing at all, but they have to go through certain things to just reflect the humanity. Look, while we're talking about bad times, I want to ask about lockdown a little. Uh, Richard, uh, you have a sister who uh, is also on the show. 
mm -hmm. Jessica Harmon as uh, Nyla. I was thinking uh, having a sibling on the same show is kind of like people ended up in lockdown with their families. How was it having a sister around while you were shooting? Good or bad? Uh, luckily, she didn't have to be around me all that much. We never shared too many scenes together. But it was pretty cool. I remember when, when she got the show. Um, yeah, there's nothing else to say about it other than it was pretty cool that we both I, ended up I, on the same show eventually. I got a question. <laughs> Billy, let's get to brass tacks. What's yeah. it like part of Canadian uh, uh, film royalty? <laughs> well, Ty, it feels good. It feels yeah. real good. <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know out there, the Harmon family has been in the film and television industry in Canada for decades. And the oh, other yeah. all wonderful people. And, and you've all made a huge impact on the Canadian film and television industry. And you guys should be proud of that. Thank so how's, you, how's that, how's that being part of that shit, man? <laughs> that feels good. That feels real good. Um, yeah, it feels solid. By the way, Ty, mom and dad doing real good. Uh, ha happy and healthy, you'll be glad to hear. Good. That is good um, to hear. And I think Jess and Lenny are up on some lake right now, relaxing in the sunshine. You know, I guess what I was getting at, did she ever say, you know, Richard, you're really acting like Murphy right now, so cut that out, you know? I don't know if I ever act like Murphy too much, although it'd be better to ask these guys if I ever acted like Murphy. I don't know if I did. I, I think it's different with a, with a sibling, but. Um, oh, no. Like, Jess, Jess, Jess and I have a very specific, uh, specific relationship, which we know well. Um, it's I wouldn't say it's Murphy towards her. It's more just Richard Harmon being an asshole to his sister. Brother. So let me yeah. pivot back to Chris. Being for brother. A That's it. <laughs> I want to pivot back to Chris for a second. Okay. Monty's a tech whiz. Chris is not. Having played somebody like that, what do you feel now? Is it kind of weird when you feel people, I mean, his technical skills were so needed. Is it weird to see now so many people rejecting science? I'm carrying over a little of what we talked about in the last thing. What's Seeing through the lens of having played Mondi, what do you think when you look at people who say, oh, I don't need to do this or I don't need to wear a mask? Do you have a different feeling about it than you might have before you did the, did the show? Uh, hmm. No, when it comes to like, COVID specific now, but LA is just reopening, you know, it reopened like last Friday and you can see the division, like 50% of people are wearing masks and honoring uh, the protocol and then half just don't give a yeah. shit at all. Yeah. It's really disheartening. I'm really, yeah. I mean, we're trying to play it safe and play by the rules, but when half the people aren't doing it, it really, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I can't wait. Yeah, it seems to me the hundred was a little bit about a show. What happens? Cause look, one minute they thought there were no survivors and they had to leave Earth, and then there were survivors, but the survivors were people who had the the education knocked out of them. You know, they were starting from scratch. And if you look at it, it's kind of a series about what happens when these hyper smart people who are in orbit come down to the ground where they're people who uh, did not have med school for their healers. And uh, I don't know, it's weird that now all these years later since it started, it's it's kind of a metaphor uh, for what's going on now. Any thoughts about that? Bring it to current day? Yeah, Ty. <laughs> yeah, well, Ty. Out there, it is out there riding your motorcycle. This this happens when we when we are and please don't anybody take this wrong, but education is key. And when when people um lack the education about science, they lack trust in it. And so when we underfund our schools, yeah. underfund education in our society. Um, the, the results are evident. We get people that are suspicious of. I mean, a caveman thought that you know thunder was God angry, and I mean, the more ignorant you are to to um, to science and facts, of course, people are going to believe it. And so, of course, in the 100, that's what happened as well. When you get people that are that are raised with no formal education and basically generations of just surviving, yeah, uh, they start believing in sky gods and stuff. And um, we kind of see that now. I mean, if you if you look at the people who are COVID deniers, if you will, and science deniers, and the Earth is flat, and Australia is a made up place. I mean, the, the, the amount of ridiculous things in there, not made up. I know, I know. <laughs> Can one attest to that one. That are out. <laughs> and why is that? Oh, it's because people are traveling, because people are educated. That we're not putting ed money into education. We're not putting money into science uh, education and, and general education. And, yeah, I mean, that's why the 100 is exactly what happens when you wow. move up. 
investigators out of society. We nailed it. That's that's, that's some great insight. <laughs> I, I, I would almost like to leave it at that, but I got one more question I want to ask, a very quick question. I mentioned to a, I mentioned it to a couple of you guys because I wonder where are the pets on the hundred? So we hit an apocalypse. Which species do you want to see survive in addition to humans? Chris. Well, uh, sorry, I jumped line. Jump line. Jump line. No, jump in. I have to think about it. Go for it. I'm going Richard. wolves. That's the easy, easy spot for me. Wolves. Well, first off, I love them. Secondly, wolves always just seem to temp like temper things into like a better situation into kind of the way that it should be. They're just pre-dogs, though. They're eventually going to become dogs again. They're going to hang out with us for hundred thousand years, and they'll be dogs. No. No, I mean, eventually, maybe. We're going to eat the dogs because they're the most domesticated. So we eat those first, and then the <laughs> wild ones become wolves again. They're the ones that are okay. I'll go. No. Well, that's your answer. I don't know if we could top that. Hey, guys, thank Chris, you so what? much. I think you're going into uh, yeah. private chat rooms. I hope it's not what it sounds like. It sounds like fun. But, uh, Do I have to and, change? Huh? Do I have to change my clothes? <laughs> I'm thinking, think, I'm thinking requests for my clothing and mine. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, that's kind of the time on this. Oh, let me find out from Keith. Are we supposed to answer some questions first? I'm not sure. Maybe we, maybe we do some Q and A's. Well, let me do that since he's popping them up. Yeah. Um, who is that for? Do you guys see this too, by the way? Do you yeah, see I do. questions? I do. Yeah. So let's see who wants to answer. As an actor, how do you handle telling different stories uh, in other words, a character-driven story versus a plot-heavy story. Uh, in other words, in science fiction stories. Who wants to take that one? Chris. God Chris. Are you kidding me? No, of course, the guy who has the most credits in film and TV passes it to the guy who has very few credits. I know that. It's, it's about you. It's about playing. You should check ties, IMDb. Before oh, you <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, I, I will, I'll let these guys tackle from the film and TV angle. I mean, for I, me... The, the biggest switch was between um, television and, and theater, just very different processes. So when I joined The 100, I was like completely green. I didn't really know anything. And so it was a bis bit of a fish out of water learning as I went. Um, yeah, I was surprised at how fast everything moves, um, how yeah. you have memory one day, and then it's just, it's out of your head forever because you're always moving on. It's always fresh. Uh, I guess what I miss though is, is having like a month rehearsal period and being able to really <laughs> And run a, run something chronologically with a live audience, so that's big. But you yeah. guys, speak, you guys speak. See, to your, your this friends. is made tailor made for you. The Zoom sure. thing. We'll have you back, and you've got you've got a huge audience of tens and tens and tens of of people here today. I don't know how many. I know how many. There's a lot driven. It's a bit of a trick question for an actor because for the actor who's playing the role, it's always character driven. That's what I thought. Yeah. That's right. Really, yeah, I mean, yes, it might be a plot heavy show, and the director's worried about that, but. Our job as actors, it's always the character. So if you're getting stuck in worrying about the plot, that's really, you've lost the plot because it's really yeah. about you being, fulfilling that character, his needs, his goals, his wants, yeah. uh, his obstacles. You and gotta so, do your job. Yeah. That's so, up to someone else. And frankly, as a writer, I have to do my job, which is I have to keep the character on top all the time. Even if I'm writing an action thing, it's gotta be how does the action impinge on this character? So good thoughts about that. Amanda Richard is asking, personally, what's your favorite part of your character's journey? I think we're just going to go to Chris every time. <laughs> Richard, what's, what's your, Richard, what's your favorite part of your character's journey? I like being bad. I like being bad. I miss being bad. But it's been fun because he's been able to kind of, you know what? Uh, I think the favorite part of the journey was kind of changeability, if that's actually even a word. I'm not 100% certain it is is anything that I could think of as an actor to do with Murphy, the kind of character he was, I could do it. And they just sort of, people would buy it. You know, like he, he, he had done so much stuff over the seven seasons that sort of by the end of it, it was like, whatever you want to do. It's sort of, he's done, he's done it all. So if he wants to go good, bad, middle, blah, blah, just lose it. If he wants to fall asleep in the middle of a scene, it, it'll it'll probably work out somehow. So I kind of like that changeability of him in there. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Keith, are you out there? Any other questions? There's one from Sophie Becker. Which fictional character would be the most exciting to meet in real life? Wow. That's a hard one. But 
Wait, wait, fictional character from the hundred or fictional yeah, character like from it sounded like any fictional character. Oh man. SpongeBob would be a good time. I'd like to get into those shenanigans. Damn it. Yeah, I gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, I just read the uh, Wolf Hall novels and uh man, Thomas Cromwell sounds like an interesting dude. So there you go. Anyone else? Uh, Fitzchilvery Farseer from the uh, Farseer books, which most people probably won't know. Yeah, I wanted to sound really smart, so I didn't say my first instinct, which was Luke Skywalker. So we'll that just, would also be pretty cool. We'll just leave it at that. I think I saw another question come in. Who's better at spaceship soccer, Raven or Murphy? That was already determined. I already beat her. Oh. <laughs> I already beat her. Keep in mind that I shot her in the spine and, and permanently messed up her, her hip a couple of years before beating her in spaceship soccer. So I might have, it was a little bit of an unfair advantage I had. I would say if I, if I hadn't had, had done that, I think she would have beaten me for sure. Right. I think you still won. What else do we got here? I'm waiting to uh, find out. I think maybe if I'm popped out, that must mean we're coming to an end here. I think we're gonna thank our actors, Christopher Larkin, Ty Olson, and Richard Murphy for uh, Richard Harmon, Richard oh, Harmon as John Murphy. Thank you. And, um, and uh, I don't think we have any more questions. So I think we're gonna say goodnight. You guys are going into uh, autograph signing. Great. Awesome. Uh, Digital autograph signing? Something like that. Something. See you guys. Something. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Morgan. Bye bye. Bye, Morgan. Bye, guys.